Hi, my name is Julie Phillips. I, uh, I go by JC Phillips if you're looking for me online and make sure you get those double P's at the end because that's a little unusual, uh, but that is how you will find me. Um, I started with picture books. I wrote and illustrated uh, four published picture books and then I shifted over to graphic novels. So this is actually um, my first graphic novel, Pacey Packer Unicorn Tracker. It's a middle grade graphic novel published through Random House. Um, and then this June book two of the series comes out, uh, Horn Slayer. So I'm gonna, so for about three years now, just every day of my life has been graphic novel, graphic novel, graphic novel, because they are considerably harder to write than the picture books. I should say create, because I'm doing the, um, the text and the images. And this is a 230 page book compared to a 32 page book. So it's taken me a lot longer. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to talk a little bit about a scene in Pacey Packer and kind of how I use uh, composition and paneling and the art to help tell the story so that works in addition to the text. So now, gonna share my screen, gonna share my screen. Oh boy, here we go. And share it and slideshow, first slide. All right, um, okay. So this is Pacey Packer, Unicorn Tracker. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just read through the scene. Uh, and then we're gonna go back and then I'm gonna break it down. But I just want everybody to be familiar with kind of what's happening without an analysis. So I'm just gonna read through it first. As we were just talking about what a pain it is to read through graphic novels on the screen, we're gonna do it. Okay, so this is the start of chapter two. This is Pacey um, down at the bottom, calling up the stairs. She is at home. She's about 12 and a half years old. She is babysitting her sister Mina for the day, and they just got into a fight. So she has a cookie as a peace offering, and she is going to uh, try to make peace with her sister. So she says, Mina, I have something special for you. And then at the bottom panel, she's getting close to Mina's door. Close your eyes and get a big page turn. Surprise! And of course, if you if we were in chapter one, it's just a regular um, sister, sister scene in the kitchen. You're not expecting at this point there to be a live unicorn in the little sister's room. And the unicorn that's on the stool is named Slasher. And in the previous scene, he was an inanimate stuffed animal. So now that he's kind of alive is also a shock to Pacey. So Pacey drops the cookie plate crash, which startles the unicorn and it rears up. As it rears up, it knocks Slasher off his stool, but he grabs the unicorn's tail and he shouts, go! And Pacey shouts, no! And Pacey leaps through the air and grabs Slasher's hoof. And then the bottom panel is Pacey, ha, gotcha! As the unicorn jumps out of the window with Mina on its back, Slasher hanging on to its tail, and Mina, or sorry, excuse me, Pacey hanging on to Slasher. And then you get the full page uh, double spread of uh, the rainbow out the window. Everybody's uh, sort of, train car, unicorn train car over the top of it. Um, and then at the panels, we've got Slasher going, let go of me. And Pacey, are you kidding? And then he's like, no, I'm slipping. I haven't really had to read Slasher a lot, so I don't have a good Slasher voice yet. And then they fall, they fall through the clouds. And now they land in Rundlin, which is the magical land of the unicorns, sort of an over the rainbow literally scene. Um, and they come bouncing off the canopies and onto a giant mushroom and into the water. And now we are in a different realm with different properties. So we're going to go back to the first page of chapter two. So anytime I'm doing a scene, 
there's going to be just little extra background stuff. And for this, it was the wallpaper. Uh, but I don't want to just make any kind of wallpaper, like a stripe or something like that. I want to try to use it. So uh, later in the story, we're going to have these um, magical fruits called pipweeds. And so I decided to use the pipweeds in the wallpaper. Of course, nobody's gonna know what this is just yet. It might be something that comes along in uh, repeated readings, but it's just a little foreshadowing. And there I showed this, this other uh, panel is the scene from later in the book with the actual pipweed. So you can sort of see what they look like compared to the wallpaper. And then there's also at the bottom of the spread is uh, the page turn. We're getting ready for the page turn, which is one of the most important things when you're composing a graphic novel because the page turn can do a lot. It can, it can be a passage of time. It can change your scene. Um, in this case, I'm using it uh, to sort of do a reveal. So the setup is the bottom panel. And then as we remember, the reveal is that something very unexpected is happening in Mina's room. You wouldn't want to have this any other way, or you wouldn't get the surprise of opening the door. The, the reader essentially is opening the door with the power of the page turn. So it's really important that that panel with Pacey getting ready to open the door is at the bottom, getting ready to go for the page turn. Okay, so now we're on uh, Mina's room here. And again, Mina's, an artist, that's a character choice for her. So I figured she'd have a lot of art on her walls, but I wanna use that art. I don't wanna just be anything a little girl would draw. So these are all kind of specific things and they foreshadow some of the things that we're gonna see as we go through the book. Like this little creature that's hugging the tree on the bottom uh, is a mimijack, which is a creature that's gonna be in the next scene that's gonna sort of move the plot forward. Uh, you know, no, it's nothing that a little girl's imagination couldn't come up with, but it's just kind of a little extra information for a reader, again, that maybe they wouldn't notice until a repeated uh, reading of it, but you want to use that. And then we have um, this bird, and the bird is kind of important because I had found when I was writing this book that I had an unanswered question which was how are the unicorns back in Rundlin communicating with Slasher, who is the stuffed animal unicorn down here. Um, not, not the one on the bottom, the one that's alive over by the unicorn who's standing on the stool. Because uh, he is sort of established later on in the book that he's been communicating back and forth. And there has to be a way that they were communicating. And I decided to go with a messenger bird. So you can see the bird has a little message on its uh, claw. Uh, is that is that bird technology or anatomy claw foot? <laughs> it's escaping me now. Um, never in the text do I discuss these messages or talk about the birds even. But in the art, I am uh, I'm explaining how they're having communication. Um, and then by Pacey dropping the plate. Uh, that's going to be action that's going to propel the plot forward because if she doesn't drop the plate, she doesn't necessarily uh, spook the unicorn, which uh, knocks Slasher off and he grabs the tail and so forth and so on and so forth. So again, here we have the bird. So the story, the, the, the story, the unwritten no text story of the bird comes into play because we see the bird gets spooked and then it fly out the window. Um, also, paneling is also a really important way to help tell the story in graphic novels because, you know, you always have your standard rectangular paneling, which just sort of is like beats of the story. But I find that when I'm doing something either that's an action sequence or um, it's exciting or scary, something that's got, kind of got an elevated energy, I like to use angles in my panels. So because this was, I wanted to show uh, her jumping, I decided to do this sort of angled panel. And then I broke 
the boundaries of the panels, uh, which usually, I, sometimes I can do it strictly for an artistic reason, like maybe her hand just overlaps a little bit and looks better to have the full hand. But in this case, uh, I, I specifically chose to break the boundaries because they are leaving the room and they're getting ready to leave kind of the human realm. So you see the unicorn breaking the boundaries and you see Slasher up above breaking the boundaries of the panel and the page. Slasher goes completely off page. So because this scene is kind of like um, a bigger scene out into the world, uh, I wanted to have a full two page spread with no boundaries, but because a two page spread with no boundaries can take up a little bit of time. You know, it's all about pacing too. I didn't want to lose the momentum of them racing across this rainbow. So I went ahead and did some inset panels to keep the story moving. This wasn't going to have a lot of information down at the bottom part of the page. So I felt like I could afford it. Um, so that's when you have them starting to go over the rainbow, but a little action scene here. Oh, and then we have the bird, the bird flying ahead. So you can also see the bird's not just flying willy-nilly, the bird's following the path of the rainbow back over into Rundlin. And then a full two-page spread of them falling, which again, I wanted to give a moment in time to this because they are actually transitioning from one realm to the other realm. And I thought that was important enough to give the whole image. Plus I thought it would look cool. Um, and then they're falling into the panels from off page, entering this world. And I just broke the panels up to kind of show their movement in time while still in the same space. And then this again, we're jumping to like the second part, like act two of the book where we see the bird and we see all the messages. So this is Arcane, who's the alpha unicorn uh, and all the messages come to Arcane. And again, I don't, there's there's no part where I talk about this bird at all in this book, but I needed to know how they were going to communicate because sometimes kids ask me those questions. And honestly, sometimes those questions don't come to me until I'm well, I've written the book. Um, so then I, I, I drew it in and now it's part of it, but not a text part. Um, and then that's just, uh, you know, a little, a little promotion for my book coming out. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, could you keep the screen up, Julia? Oh, yeah. You know, because uh, when I put my presentation, I, I kind of picked singular examples. I love that you um, broke down a sequence. And I think what's great about that, um, if you could go back to the beginning, I just wanted to comment on something because sure. uh, something that I, I, I'll be mentioning in mine as well is that um, uh, this beginning something like this mentioned about the yeah if you go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back okay sure. um there's a couple things she does which i'm going to talk about in mine as well so uh what she mentioned here about the power of the page turn is so important um and one thing to think about graphic novels if you're a teacher is i know a lot of teachers talk about poetry and rhythm uh there's a rhythm to graphic novels and uh julie's really got a great handle on it um and one of the things uh this idea that the um that the 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 page turns just as she opens the door is like a great metaphor i mean that's just a really nice metaphor for like turning the page and revealing and then if you turn the page um something that uh i'll mention in mind as well is that full pages full pages are dramatic moments you know full pages are like you know it's like a rhythm can be like that that boom, you know, it's like, this is, and, and, and the reader instinctively understands the idea that a, a full page is more important. You know, you don't have a full page of two people just moving the plot along through conversation, because it just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and uh, if you go forward again, too, let's see. I also, I'm glad she mentioned the, um, that, that dynamic panel up front, because what she's also doing is, she's implying movement by, um, by having both the, the panels angled and leaning, but also showing, this is something that you do too, is you show part of the rhythm is to show the same figure moving forward slightly, 
in time. And that implies action. You mm -hmm. know, it's implying the fact that she's running. It's, uh, you know, and um, as teachers, if you guys want to teach graphic novels, you know, a great f uh, thing to look at is uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics or Making Comics. And one thing that he talks about, which I don't, I don't teach specifically because it gets a little technical, but he talks about panel transitions. And what she's doing here is like moment to moment. And moment to moment panel transition, what it does is it, it, it puts the, the reader's attention on this action, you know? And so you really feel, it more, makes it more cinematic. You make, cause you know, you, leave, you have to leave out a lot when you do a graphic novel. Uh, but there are times when you show an action really much more almost as, as almost as like a mini film. And that's kind of what she's doing here. Cause you get the rising feeling and all of that. And um, so there's just a couple of things I wanted to point out. I mean, you, I noticed you really use the full panel spread as well when they're falling, which is really important because um, that's also super dramatic, you know, and the reader feels it as being more dramatic. If you guys can imagine what this panel would look like if it was only one out of four on a page, it wouldn't feel nearly as, as action packed. So, um, so there's just a lot, of great, uh, a lot of great storytelling things in here. And I think, I think as a teacher, a good approach is to, is to ask a question like, how does the, the author's choices increase the drama or something like that, you know? And that's, and what you're really trying to do, I think with graphic novels is build in, in, in a classroom is build the same skill of closely paying attention to the narrative. It's just, you're identifying different tools to do that, you know? You're not saying like, well, what's the use of descriptive language? You're saying, well, what's the use of panel size? You know, yeah. but it's all kind of encouraging the same thing, which is is a deep reading of the literature. Right. And I, I, and I think um, this goes back to the point that Julie made earlier, is that some things reveal themselves on second readings or third readings, right? So yeah. with, with poems or plays, Ja, Julie, don't lose your stuff because I want to point. Oh, okay. Do you want um, me to go back to something? Go back to the um, splash page where they, after they've opened the door. Yeah, back. No. Nope. Oh. Oh, so, yeah. One yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Sorry, but um, right. The idea that like attentive reading in in you know in English classes and other classes, students are encouraged to do close reading, right? So paying close attention to the text and looking for textual evidence and things like that, and so picking up the bird and thinking about the bird is an example of that, right? So you're not drawing a, a neon arrow to it going like, check this out, like this is an important part. But if you're doing a close reading of this, you're like, oh, I keep seeing that bird, like, you know, and then you can start to ask questions about that. Maybe not the first time, but maybe the second time that you read it. What I like about this panel in particular, uh, this page in particular, two things is that one, uh, they're all looking to the right, right? Because that's where the narrative momentum is going. The text keeps going forward to the page, right? And then, um, and that's how we read as well. We generally start from the left and move over to the right. So it builds up this narrative momentum. But the other thing that I think is really interesting about this page is characterization, right? And that's one thing that we always ask students to think about, right? So what do you know about the character and why do you know that about the character? And from, you know, from just looking at this page, you know, maybe some of the people that are that are here as participants, like in the, the chat area, like, what do you think about Mina? So what do you think about the sister? What do you think you know about her just from that drawing? How might you describe her personality or her character? She likes unicorns, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. What else can you say? What else do you think you could say about her? I mean, Julie told us a little bit about what she likes to do, but obviously we can pick that up from the text, from the book yeah. as well. But yes, I agree with Amy, right? So she's on the surface, she's like sweet and innocent, right? But like something else is going on there, right? She certainly looks confident to me, right? She does not look like a shrinking violet of any sort, right? So she seems to be a confident young girl. Um, her pet, her pet unicorn, what do you think you know about him? Are 
Are you talking about Slasher? Or are you talking about the big No, one? Slasher. Sorry. That's I guess yeah. I was pet. That's demeaning him, but Slasher. So what do you th what do you guys think about Slasher? The tiny unicorn on the stool. Yeah, Slasher's on the stool. Yeah. Okay. Mischievous, Julie, would you agree that Slasher is somewhat mischievous, possibly? Yes, I'm a, I actually can't see any comments, so unless you, you say it, I don't know what they're saying. But um, okay. yes, yes, he's, um, <laughs> there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of conflict between Slasher and Pacey when they both land in Rundlin, uh, neither one exactly where they want to be. So yeah, mischievous would be a word for him. Um, no. Krista describes him as a troublemaker. Yes, a troublemaker. that would that would be accurate as well. Yes, and then the full scale unicorn. How would people describe that full scale unicorn, personality wise, characterization wise? I'd say it's a little hard to tell at this point. I mean, I think. Um, uh, someone said, that's a tough one. I need more. I kind of feel the same way. I mean, he looks a little suspicious or he looks maybe a little annoyed, like, don't get involved in our game here. Like, can't you see we're busy? Yeah. He looked to me to read too much into it, I think. I don't know. My first impression of him is a bit aloof. A bit. Yeah, it's kind of, of an aloof eye. Maybe a aloof yeah. eye and a little bit, not arrogant, but, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't think he's a, I don't think he's just kind of a rough and tumble. I think he's, yeah, Chris has said he's stoic. I feel like he's somewhat regal or somewhat, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's, he seems a bit out of place, but he's okay with it. Maybe it seems like <laughs> so, but, but this is the types of conversations, right. That we have with our students. How do you describe a character? Uh, and so we look for that in textual evidence the language an author uses to describe a character. And here, it may be the language that Julie uses in the text, but it's also the images that she's creating of these characters, right? And so we can have that same sort of conversation about the characters in a graphic novel, right? What do you think about them? Do you trust them, right? Do you think, what do you think about their motivations, right? All these types of things that we do with characters in traditional text, we can do with graphic novels as well. Um, any other questions for, for Julie about her work or her suggestions about how it was constructed before we turn our attention to, to Kevin? Well, I was wondering if, uh, if we, if Julie, if we had been introduced to your main character's uh, artistic inclinations already, or is this where we get the first clue? Um, there's a little bit um, here. I'm gonna escape now and then I can show you. Um, stop. Oh. Are we good? Did it stop sharing my screen? No, we still see your screen. You still see? Oh, there it is. Stop sharing. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, basically, uh, the way the book is introduced is it starts with a fantasy. See, I'm going to, most of my light is natural light. And as it starts approaching, there we go. There's a little, let's get some artificial light. Um, it starts in a fantasy scene. Uh, mm -hmm. Pacey is having a daydream. I mean, people don't know it if they're just opening the book for the first time because they, it's, it's fully immersive fantasy. And then we jump over to, um, the kitchen and that's where you see that it's, it's, it's a, she's making lunch. And so all the things in the fantasy kind of like are her hero complex combined with making lunch, like she's saving baby carrots and stuff like that. And so this is the first time you see Pacey it for real and Mina for real and Slasher for real. So we get to introduce a little bit to um, Mina wanting to be uh, art, an artist or artistic over here when she's creating her own kind of superhero character. If she had a fantasy, it would be more like that. But really, um, it's much more about Pacey and Pacey's kind of fantasy self and how she sees herself as a hero and responsible um in the first chapters and which is why she's trying to make it up with her sister because her sister threatens to tell the parents that Pacey's not doing a good job as a babysitter and Pacey takes all this very seriously because it's like how she identifies herself um which gets the story started yeah because the point I was going to make is that um when we think of uh, characterization in a traditional novel 
you might describe activities they like to do, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of times in a graphic novel, um, it's a background of a room. You know, I, I sometimes when I teach comics, I have people design characters. And if it's this type of slice of life story, I almost always say, let's have a scene in the character's room. And maybe you just want to pace around the room and show the things. And this is like classic movie stuff too, you know. I can't remember if it's E.T. or maybe some other famous movie where like they start out and they're just slowly panning along the room and you're like, oh, the boy likes this, the boy likes this, the boy likes this. And that's like a visual, a visual form of characterization, you know, yep. character building. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though yeah, you'd already met Pacey, by the time we reach book three, we go into Pacey's bedroom. And so I had to do all that kind of stuff too, kind of beyond what you know about her, what kind of things is she going to have in her room to flesh out that character? Is she going to be neat? Is she messy? You know, does she have awards and are they on display? Does she have pictures of her friends? Um, things like that. Uh, and just questions that I hadn't really had to answer yet, just to flesh her out and what her room would be like. Right. And somebody in the comments mentioned something early on about it's like a Where's Waldo kind of thing of reading. And that's really true. You know, and that's a good way to also have kids do deep reading is asked for visual clues. Like, what are things you see in the picture that tell us about this character? You know, things like that. And I think that's a really good emphasis for teachers uh, to do. And what's really nice about it is that it um, it's really works well for those reluctant readers, you know, because they can answer, they can analyze literature. It's just sometimes they get intimidated by pages of words and, you know, uh, but they, but they, but they can still talk about literature, and they can still talk about plot, and they can talk about all the things they see in movies and stuff. And so it's a really, um, I think that's one of the things graphic novels are such a great tool for is reaching, um, you know, is like kind of accessing your students' abilities that maybe you are kind of hidden by some of the, by some of the rigors of, you know, well, what's the preposition and what's the adverb and what's the, you know. Yeah. Amy, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, Julie, in terms of like the color scheme, because I've seen a few different graphic novels specifically using the either black and white or using just one color in addition to all that. Did you make that purposeful? Is that just because it contrasts well? Like how if because obviously if we're looking at the images and and trying to look cl more closely at them would there be a reason that students would look at that or is that just an artistic it's, choice it's not um it's not like some deep meaningful reason it, it boiled down to a couple things one was just having a look that was different from other graphic novels in the same area so it might stand out in the marketplace a little differently um another i mean this was more for me because this is my first graphic novel the picture books i did i did in collage like like i cut pieces of paper and glued them down so this was the first time i was doing digital art mm -hmm. um and you know when you're having to balance a bunch of colors and you're just learning how to use photoshop and everything i thought it would be easier for me personally to limit my uh, color palette. So it was sort of a combination of just artistic choices. It didn't have, it doesn't have anything really to do with the analysis of the story or anything like that. Got it. But we will see how <laughs> color does play a role in narrative. Right. Well, <laughs> and and so it just wasn't narrative. for me, yeah. Right. And also, you know, if our model of interpretation is that, you know, how does it resonate with you? It doesn't really matter what the author intended if you find a right. certain meaning in it and, and a reading that way. So Yeah, I will say it's kind of an aesthetic in graphic novels that was established pretty early on, probably because of printing costs and things like that. I mean, you see a lot of graphic novels that are monotone or two color. And um, I will agree with Julia, it's sometimes really, um, you know, you use color to organize a page and, and graphic novels are different than like full paintings in the sense that it is a symbolic language and simplifying the color kind of helps the narrative sometimes. Sometimes you see things that are overly colored. They're yeah. like, I mean, you can tell the author put tons and tons of work into them, but in a way it almost, I don't know if it distracts from the story, but it's, it's, not, it's not altogether necessary in some ways. Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen like, um 
when I've, when I've, cause my, one of my, uh, recent novels that I did or, or short stories that I did was the metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. And there's a graphic novel version of that, which I, I used instead. Um, but to teach them sort of like looking at panels, I gave them some examples. And one of them was some sort of superhero comic and so many colors yeah. that for me, it just, it overwhelms me. That's why I've, I haven't really personally gotten into many graphic novels because the images overwhelm me so much often. I find that if somebody's really good at mastering color, um, a scene will have a tone to it. It's not like I can use every color, but there'll be some overriding, uh, a very specific palette choices. If I was going to do this now, having three under my belt really and coming into it, um, and I was going to, especially changing worlds, for the real, the reality of the house and the kitchen and Mina's room, I would choose probably um, some muted colors. And then when I would go over into Rundlin, things might be a little brighter, but probably I would try to take colors that you wouldn't naturally expect to see on the page. The color of the sky might be yellows. The color of the grass might be pinks. I'd probably try to play things up a little bit. You still, I still feel like a, a limited palette is, is good, but um, you definitely can use the colors to play a lot more and set the tone when you're going that way. Yeah, there's a, there's a novel called Blood Song, which is for uh, definitely for an older, well, somewhat older audience. And it's a textless graphic novel. Um, and it's about somebody in sort of like a difficult political situation, kind of dystopia city. And it's mostly like dark blues and, you know, sort of grays and that sort of stuff. There's a couple splashes of red when the blood's there, but then also there's a jazz musician playing in the street corner and the sounds coming out of his saxophone are yellow, right? And so you've got this great contrast of this drab sort of dystopia and then this colorful flavor of life, nice. you know, coming out of this musical instrument. And so that's when I think like, yeah, there's only like five colors, but that meant that yellow really popped, right? And then yeah, really, you're going to notice that. You're going to yeah. really notice that. So. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm mindful of the time. So let's switch over to Kevin. Um, and then Julie, feel free to comment on Kevin's as, as Kevin oh, modeled for you as well. But I loved it. That was great. Yeah.